Welcome to the millionth camera comparison on the internet. But this will be different because we're comparing a Canon camera to a Kodak. The Canon camera is the Canon EOS R3 from 2021, which at the time of this review is Canon's most capable full frame hybrid mirrorless camera. The Kodak is the DCS Pro SLRC, Kodak's most capable full frame DSLR from 2004. So this is a comparison across time. The Canon has 24 megapixels, an ISO range from 100 to 100,000, which is expandable to 50 to 200,000. The Kodak has 14 megapixels without a low-pass filter, an ISO range from 160 to 1600, which is expandable to 6 to 1600. We'll get to that later. In 2004 there were only two full-frame DSLRs available, the Kodak and the Canon 1DS, which had 11 megapixels and an ISO range of 100 to 1250. Adjusted for inflation, the Kodak cost about as much as the R3 does now. The 1DS was twice the price. Everything else had a cropped sensor back then. Both cameras have pro bodies with large batteries. However, the grip on the Kodak is everything but pro. It has an awkward shape and is too small even for my hands. You are always aware that you are carrying the camera because it feels like it wants to slip out of your hands every time you loosen your grip. It's unnecessarily tiring. In contrast, your hands really hook onto the Canon body. According to my professional measuring equipment, both bodies weigh basically the same. The Kodak feels more nimble because its weight is more evenly distributed, but as soon as a lens is attached, it no longer matters. What matters is Canon's protruding EVF, which makes using the camera so much easier. It is the polar opposite to Kodak's annoying lump at the bottom of the camera. Both cameras have of course flash connectors. For computer access, the Canon has a USB and the Kodak a Firewire port. Video out for the Canon is an atrocious micro HDMI port and composite video for the Kodak. Of course, only for photo playback. It's years away from live mode. While the Canon has internal GPS, the Kodak has to connect to a GPS receiver via a serial port. Actually not bad, only four years after GPS had been made available to the public. Both cameras allow the recording of audio snippets for every picture taken. Canon's LCD is of course light years ahead of Kodak's and Canon's 120Hz OLED HDR AVF is so good that you really don't need or want an optical viewfinder any longer. Shooting in portrait mode works really well with a Canon. All relevant buttons and dials are either doubled or reachable in both orientations. The Kodak in portrait mode feels awkward again. You have the separate shutter button but nothing else is in reach. The grip is bad and with an unfortunately balanced lens you may accidentally open the card door which makes you lose your grip even quicker. The Canon has two card slots, one for SD cards and one for CF Express Type B. The Kodak also has two slots, one multimedia card slot, the precursor to SD cards, and one compact flash Type 2 slot. The larger CF Type 2 slot allowed the use of IBM's microdrive. A compact flash sized hard disk with the insane capacity of 1 gigabyte. But while the capacity is laughable by today's standards, it is still cool. It isn't fast though. A write speed of about 3 megabytes per second was slow even then. Compact flash reached almost 11 megabytes per second at the time. Today's CF Express cards exceed 1.3 gigabytes per second. Sustained. Why there is such a slow read speed for the CF Express card, I don't know. Even copying files under Windows is around 1 gigabyte per second. Let's try burst shooting, starting with the R3 and the mechanical shutter, which is almost always unnecessary because the sensor is so fast that there are next to no rolling shutter artifacts. That's 12 frames per second and with a flash card that fast, the camera could continue indefinitely. 
Let's use only the electronic shutter. We can now shoot at 30 frames per second. The buffer is now full. And already 173 images and 3.9 gigabytes have been written to the memory card. Let's hold the shutter button down even after the buffer is full. The sound you're hearing is just an audio sample for feedback which you can turn off. The camera would then be completely silent. And there we have some stuttering. But it's still impressive. That's almost 700 megabytes per second. The card can do twice as much, so we are limited by the camera's controller. But for a low power application, these are really respectable values. On to the codec. A lot of progress happened in the 17 years that lie between the cameras. Now the buffer is full and until it's been written to the card, I'll have time to summarize the company history. In 1884, George Eastman invented film so that photographers no longer needed to carry boxes of photographic plates and toxic chemicals. In 1888, his Kodak camera was marketed by highlighting the simplicity of the process. You press the button, we do the rest. The Eastman Kodak company was founded in 1892. They sold inexpensive cameras and made money by selling and developing film and prints. They provided professional services for businesses around the world and quickly held a dominant market position in photography. Kodak developed the first self-contained digital camera in 1975. It captured black and white images and recorded them to compact cassette tape. It had a resolution of 0.01 megapixels and capturing an image took 23 seconds. Then the engineers were told that it was cute but had no future. Despite even having invented the Bayer filter, Kodak then slept through much of the early digital age, always proclaiming that film would be better. Ironically, ignoring what had made them great as a company, building on the simplicity of a new process. But the newfangled digital stuff simply wasn't allowed. However, vanishing sales numbers forced them into it. Yet they didn't change their strategy. Selling inexpensive cameras and making money with consumables, which of course didn't exist any longer, hence the simplicity of digital cameras. The Kodak DCS Pro SLRC was the last hurrah in 2004 before it was discontinued in 2005. It made no money because they couldn't sell their non-existing consumables. So Kodak went back to film and when even movie production went digital, Kodak filed for bankruptcy in 2012. Well, that took 1 minute and 48 seconds. And that was with a speedy 10 megabytes per second flash card and not the microdrive. But what is the image quality like? The Kodak only has 14 megapixels, but no low pass filter. This should allow a lot of detail and probably give the 24 megapixel Canon R3 a run for its money. But having no low pass filter puts high demands on the debayering algorithm and back in the day it simply wasn't possible without color artifacts. Kodak's own software produces quite a lot of them. Here you can see an image taken with the R3 and one with the Kodak. Both images are unsharpened. You can see that in the fine details the Kodak comes really close to the Canon, but also produces horrendous color artifacts. Maybe modern softwares would be better, but they won't read the Kodak's raw files. While with some hex editor magic they can be convinced to at least load the file, but they all seem to fall back to a very rudimentary algorithm that even seems to interpolate across edges. But it's not that bad. I have deliberately chosen a worst case scenario for the Kodak here. Most of the time it delivers really awesome pictures. Often you won't even find artifacts when pixel peeping. And I've never missed any dynamic range either. So this is also somewhat a comparison between old and new algorithms. But first things first. Here we have pictures of a color chart taken with a Kodak at various ISO settings and without noise reduction. All those pictures were taken with 1 30th of a second. While ISO 160 is reasonably clean, noise is visible at all other ISO settings, even when heavily scaled down as in this case. Hopefully the visual information will survive YouTube compression. The same chart with the Canon shows all images to be noisy, but these start at ISO 12800. 
And even that, like ISO 200 on the codec, is fine in real-world use without noise reduction. Here you can judge the noise pattern of the two cameras, each at max ISO without noise reduction, again at 1 30th of a second. Which one looks better is probably a matter of taste. While the Canon clearly shows more noise, its noise pattern is much more fine-grained and more pleasing to at least my eyes. The big color blotches of the Kodak are not pretty. Here's the chart with both cameras at ISO 1600. So where's the quality? ISO 51000 on the Canon still looks slightly better than ISO 1600 on the Kodak. ISO 100K is, well, mostly worse? Let's just say that ISO 51000 in 2021 is equivalent to ISO 1600 in 2004. That's five stops less noise. Impressive. But what about noise reduction? If you think that the algorithm should have improved over the decades, you're absolutely right. Here's the 51000 and 1600 comparison without and with noise reduction. The modern algorithms transform the ISO 51000 image into a completely usable one. So where does it end? 100,000? No. 200,000? Yes, roughly, but wow! Modern denoising gives us another two usable stops of ISO performance, meaning ISO 1600 with noise reduction in 2004 is equivalent to ISO 200,000 with noise reduction in 2021. That's a seven-stop improvement and justifies a swear word of your choice. Here is a high-contrast real-world example with a one-to-one -one enlargement in the upper right corner. First with the codec at ISO 800, then 1600. Now the Canon at 25,000, then at 51,000. The same again with noise reduction. And for the Canon, we now go all the way up to ISO 200,000. So, where is the equivalent of the old ISO 1600? Somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000. Judge for yourself. Please ignore the different levels of sharpness. I conducted the test so that the shutter speed stayed at a constant 1 30th of a second throughout the entire ISO range, so that I had realistic noise levels in all images. At those super high ISO values, F32 and a lot of variable ND was required. So even downscale to the Kodak's 14 megapixels, things are soft. Next, autofocus. In the past, I only used center point AF and then reframed. As I'm not a sports shooter, that's all I needed. And the Kodak, well, it's not even that good at center point AF. You can see it lose focus about halfway through. The lens was a Canon EF 70-200 2.8 IS Mark II at 200mm and f2.8, so definitely no slouch. The Canon mirrorless, however, this is not a video in the traditional sense, but a burst of images captured at 30 frames per second, with subject tracking and all kinds of metering activated and working at the same 30 frames per second. The IAF knows what you are looking at in the viewfinder, and when you half press the shutter button, the machine learning algorithms take over and continue tracking the subject you were looking at for you, so you are free to look elsewhere again. And because it's a mirrorless, and therefore the pixels itself are the autofocus points, it works over the entire image area and with astounding speed and precision. I was letting the object tracking follow the car, but instinctively started to pan when it came close to the frame border. Then I consciously corrected, and that's why it's so shaky in the end. I left it in because the camera kept tracking the car perfectly. Seriously impressive, especially for someone like me who has grown up using split-screen indicators. I was pretty mad when the Canon 5D Mark III no longer allowed the use of focusing screens, but with the various focus assist tools in mirrorless cameras, manual lenses now work better than ever. So, what have we learned? Well, nothing actually. No one expected the old camera to be better in ergonomics or image quality, right? But 
it's the amount of nothing that hopefully won't make this wasted time. Oh, and one thing, the expanded ISO range of the Kodak. In certain exposure modes, you can choose ISO values as low as 6 in conjunction with certain exposure times. There are some restrictions, but overall it could save you carrying ND filters around. Choosing the appropriate aperture will give you perfect long exposure images. While even Canon cameras have intervalometers now, the expanded low ISO values are something I actually miss to this day in modern cameras. So that's it. I'm excited for the next 17 years of camera development, because this time I actually don't know what will come next. I'm still hoping for light field technology, but let's see. In 17 years I'll make a follow-up video. See you then.